Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. We got a crazy story of somebody setting fire to a dumpster for revenge. But first a story from Bloom Sara. I stopped my neighbors loud parties and they ended up moving. Our neighbors had very, very loud parties frequently that would go until 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. even on weeknights. When I walked by his house to check my mail, he would mutter insults to himself about me and my kids. I tried to talk to him through his adult son because my Spanish isn't that great and his English was no better. I didn't feel good about calling the cops on him because he's a minority and his English is poor. Nothing worked. Other neighbors did call the cops on him and his family, but it didn't work anyway. Finally, I had completely had it and ordered this stuff called liquid butt. A couple squirts were supposed to be effective, but I didn't know how well it would really work from the other side of our shared wooden fence. The next party was a Tuesday night, and it was around midnight, and there was super loud music and tons of people dancing and drinking, as usual. I went outside and poured the entire 4 ounce bottle on my side of the fence along the fence line, then quickly ran back inside. Within 20 minutes, the music was off and the guests were chattering trying to figure out what was wrong. The guests left to my delight, and everyone in my house finally got some sleep. The following day, there was a huge sewage repair company truck outside their house most of the day. A month later, a for sale sign appeared for one day and it was sold to a very quiet lady who said, I hope my wind chimes aren't too loud for you. I do not miss them at all. If you had loud obnoxious neighbors, would you hesitate to call the cops on them? Or would you personally find it quite easy to call the cops and make a noise complaint? Let me know how you guys would feel in the comments down below. Our next story is from NimptyPE0. I got an annoying jerk kicked out of a nightclub I work at. I work at a nightclub part-time as floor staff. My job is to collect empty cups and generally clear up after all the messy drunk people. This particular night, my mood was slowly going down, mostly because I had to clean up vomit three times before the incident, six times total by the end of the night. I'm walking through the dance floor with a half-full basket of cups, doing my usual route for the hundredth time when I feel a tug on my hair. My hair is about shoulder length, not too long, but quite long for a guy. I whip around and see a guy laughing. I instantly say, don't, as sternly as I can. He just goes, ooh, like a child who's in trouble but doesn't care and just continues laughing. I instantly turn around and grab security. Luckily, there was one posted just a few feet away from where this happened. I point to the guy and say, him, kick him out. The bouncer then starts escorting him through the dance floor and out into the alleyway. The alleyway leads to the entrance and exit. I start to go back to my job, but I just can't. I drop off the basket and head to the staff smoking area to try to calm down. I take deep breaths and then sit down for a minute with my head in my hands. After a couple of minutes, I think I've calmed down enough to go back. On the way back, I see the guy with his friend talking to the bouncer that escorted him off the dance floor and pass them on my way to grab something opposite their direction. I then run into my manager, who then asks me what happened with the guy outside. I tell him just kick the guy out. He says he wants to know what happened first. I tell him a quick version of what happened in a rather pissed off tone and start to go back to my job. At this point, I'm really pissed off again and having trouble getting back to a level of calm I work with. I have to pass the guy and he actually apologizes saying he was just messing around and reaches his hand out for me to shake it. I take a deep breath and a second to think. I think I should say, any other day I would let it go, but today I was in a terrible mood. Then tell the bouncer to just kick him out and move on. But instead, I shake his hand, say it's alright and go back to work still seething and now in the worst mood I've been in in a long time. I catch up with a friend from my secondary school and tell him what happened. He's sympathetic and tells me to go take more time to calm down. I still work, but I'm feeling a little better. Thinking, because he actually apologized, he's probably back on the dance floor, barely learning his drunk lesson. While on my route, I pass the bouncer that escorted him again and ask him how it went. He says after he got the guy to apologize, they kicked him out. I have the biggest grin on my face. And later, my manager notices. He says after I told him what happened, he got the head bouncer and told him to kick him out. The head bouncer just told them, you don't touch staff, and told them to leave. Them, because the guy that did it and his friend, both got kicked out. I felt a little bad for the friend because he didn't do anything, but also he didn't do anything. 
He could have stopped or at least chastised his friend for what he did, but he didn't really say anything to him or me when it happened. He wasn't banned, but my mood went from awful to satisfied really quick. I think the guy deserved to get kicked out and possibly even banned for being a jerk like that and grabbing people's hair that works there. The bouncers very right when they say, you don't touch staff. In fact, you probably just shouldn't touch anybody that isn't asking for it. And by that, I mean literally asking for it. This next story is from Erin Brew Dependent, entitled Mother Lets Her Kids Into My Garden. I, 29-year-old female, don't have any kids, but I have my younger sister, 16, living with me for around 10 years. And we have a trampoline still in our back garden from when she was younger. Neighbor to the left of me has four kids and moved in a year ago. Two weeks ago, Glasgow started getting really good weather, so the kids have been out playing constantly. Not an issue. They asked if I could let the kids use the trampoline one day, so I was like, sure, but only for a bit because I have friends coming over for some drinks. 7pm comes, I ask them to go home because my five friends have shown up and we're going to be drinking. Cue the crying. They had to leave the garden upset, but hey, that's not my issue. They've been on it for three hours at this point. Their mom pops her head out her bedroom window and asks if they can stay in the garden longer. Um, no, I'm not your babysitter. She's annoyed but drops it. Last week, I come home from some shopping and to my surprise, find all four of the kids in the garden plus their younger cousin. Ask them to leave, tell them they can't just come into my garden without me there, and they didn't even ask. They refuse to leave, so I shout up at their mom and tell her to get them out of the garden. She says, let them play for a bit, you don't even use it. Okay, but still, not your garden? Eventually, we get into an argument and they leave. She's pissed off and shouting saying I'm being a Karen and I should let them in. I tell her not to ask again because the answer will be no. This happened again the day after. All four kids plus their cousin waiting till I move the car from the drive and heading straight into the garden. So I wake up this morning. I've since put a lock on the trampoline, just a small one on the mesh safety enclosure to stop them from opening it up, cause I'm petty as freak, plus it's Saturday. I'm not working today, my day off, and I want a long lie. But no, neighbor decides that at 9am this morning her kids are being fired straight out of that house with breakfast bars and a bottle of water, and they head straight into the garden. So I can hear them from my window, I look out and tell them to leave, by the time I get downstairs, mom has descended from her house and is trying to climb the fence between our gardens, shouting about how I used to let them use it and she's going to call the police for hitting her kids. Um, great, you do that. I'll be sure to show them the ring camera footage which coincidentally also has footage of your husband picking the lock open so your brats can use the trampoline. So long story short, Entitled Mother sends her kids into my garden repeatedly even after being told not to, calls police on me for harassment and hitting her kids, and ends up getting her own husband arrested for theft and housebreaking and criminal damage. Suck it, witch. OP attached a note at the bottom saying that the neighbor's back garden was too small for the trampoline. Plus for all the people that are saying, well why don't you just give them the trampoline? Well, a used trampoline is still worth a little bit of money, right? Why would you just essentially give that money away? By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Each one has awesome stories like our next one from Eccentric B. Hi, this is Allison, calling about your auto insurance. I get calls from Allison, who wants me to save on car insurance. She calls about four times a day. I used to always hang up thinking they were robocalls for some sort of scam, but about two weeks ago, I decided to see if I could get past the Allison bot and talk to a human. It was very easy. Allison asked me if I had car insurance and I said yes. Then how many cars I insured and I said three. She then asked for my zip code and my insurer and I gave her a zip from another state and a random company, State Farm. Then I got connected to a human. It was a salesperson for a real insurance company in another state, near the zip code I'd given them. I got the name of the agency, and while talking to them, I looked up the company on Facebook. Once I found the agency, I hung up and left a review on their Facebook page saying that they contacted me through an Allison Bot robocall, and that I got those calls several times a day, and that it made me feel like the company was desperate and shady, so I would never use them for insurance. 
I was careful to be truthful. Since then, every time I get an Allison bot call, I do the same thing. Give some random zip code and whatever insurance company name I think of at the time. I give info to get to a human, find out the company, and leave a review saying they robocalled me and I didn't like it. Today I got a human and got their agency name. This time I told the guy what I was going to do and how angry these repeated calls made me. He immediately sounded anxious and practically begged me not to leave a review. I said that if I got one more, I would. He promised to take me off the robocall list with the company he contracted with. I don't know if that'll work, but if not, I'll keep leaving reviews. If they're fine with calling me dozens of times a week, I'm fine leaving reviews saying how annoyed I am about it. See, the thing I don't understand about this system is like... Obviously, it's designed to just like, just absolutely blast the populace with calls out. Just to try to get like the chances of conversions up as high as you possibly can. Which is probably pretty terrible with a blatant robocall, by the way. But you would think if they had a system that blasted out these robocalls, they would be able to identify that they called this one person 10, 15 times and nothing's coming out of it. Like, in fact, they're probably burning money trying to call these people 10, 15 times over. Yeah, every once in a while I get a call about your car's extended warranty, but usually those call a time or two and then it takes them like a couple months to pop back up. Our next story is from Pitlover13. Dog owners keep taking down no dog walking signs and putting up new ones with a twist. We have a lovely park right beside our house. It's split right in the middle, one part is for dogs off leash, and the other has tons of children's playgrounds and dogs are required to be leashed. With spring here, I noticed once signs all over the on the leash part of the park, warning people not to walk their dogs around. The next day they're gone, the next week they're back. This happened several times, and I'm starting to think I'm tripping. Last night, I walked my dog around 1am, scary dog privilege, and saw two guys laughing and climbing the post the signs are put on. They started taking them down. They saw me looking and hollered, No worries, ma'am. These are not put up by the city, but by a Karen. We'll fix it. Alright, what the heck? Bye, it's a freaking sign. Even if he's lying, I'm not calling the police. On my way out, I see new signs everywhere. No kids off leash, with a little stick figure being walked by a big stick figure. Another sign along the lines of, clean after your kids with a small stick figure pooping. I laughed and walked away. The next day I saw the moms were not impressed. They had called the cops and wanted the signs down. They had admitted to putting signs up banning dog walking in front of the cops as well. The kicker? They got fined, and the cops said someone will come to take the new signs down up to 90 days. I can't stop laughing. A few dads cried, but the guys glued them down with industrial glue. This definitely had a shift in vibe in it. Very quickly, you're like, oh, how dare they take down those signs that are trying to be helpful. And then you realize the Karens were the ones putting it up, and you're like, no, no, actually, keep going, keep taking those signs down. Our next story is from Blasted Zero Glass. A mortgage lender snubbed me, so I snubbed him back. A few years ago, when I was buying a house, I went to several lenders to get the best deal and rate. I have a credit score in the 800s and quite a bit saved, so I'm getting good offers. I'd also set up a spreadsheet to compare offers and calculate which would best suit my needs. Most lenders were happy to describe interest rates, points, etc. so I could do my calculations. Most offers were very similar. According to my math, my shopping around would have only saved me a few hundred dollars over the life of the loan. And that's fine. Doing the math to verify things has value. However, one lender I called had this frustratingly rude representative. He's from a company I'll call Slickin Loans, and our conversation went something like this. What do you want out of your loan, he asks. I've answered this question like 10 times for other lenders, so I start to explain. I want the best rate and to save money in the long term. I, well, you're a pretty standard first time home buyer. You're going to need to make yourself stand out as a borrower. I say, I'm sorry, what? Everybody wants the best rate, he says. It's the first thing anyone asks for. I say, no kidding. He says, that's basic. We've got tons of people asking for loans. What's going to make you stand out? Just tell me your rate, I say. I have to give him some information for him to calculate it. Then he gives me a number that is a tenth of a percent higher than the other offers I've gotten. 
That would cost about 15000 in the long run. After adjusting for inflation, there is now literally zero chance I'll go with slick and loans. I think I'm in the call. Well, I went with a different lender. We were moving fast, so within two weeks I've gotten approved for my loan and I'm just waiting to close on the house. Everything's all set to go when the slick and loan scumbag calls me back. They say, so I'm calling you to get started on the loan we talked about. I went with a different lender, I say. What? Who? His voice has this quaver in it, like maybe he's lost the last five borrowers he's talked to and his performance review's coming up or something. Someone who gave me a better rate. I have no interest in giving him details. He says, well, you know, we can flex on the rate. I say, can you? That's unfortunate. And then my petty revenge, you really should have done more to make yourself stand out as a lender. He sputters about trying to match the other offer, and I tell him to pound sand. I'm imagining if this guy deals with anybody that's doing their due diligence trying to get a loan, which anybody who's getting a loan should be unless you're literally up to your back against the wall, his behavior is probably going to be a major turnoff for those people. Honestly, it's great to read this story because in the future, if I ever get a loan and I see any kind of behavior that seems remotely like this, I'll be able to identify that this dude's probably trying to rake me over the coals and run me up for a nasty percentage compared to what I could get. This next story is from Backbiter0723. I'm lazy? Guess you don't need my labor then. Back before my grandfather passed, he'd connected me with a friend of his who had a friend willing to give me a summer job when I turned 18. It was a pretty solid gig to do in the summer before I went to college, and it paid well. $15 an hour in Ohio. While it's not record-breaking, it certainly beat working fast food. I only worked about a month between my birthday and when I started college. But I proved to be a good worker who got the job done faster and better than anyone else. A couple things about this business, this friend of my grandfather started it himself in the 80s. It has something like 40 employees and is a machine shop that mostly deals in government contracts. They do everything from gun stocks and computer casings for the military to chemical wash tubs and lamps. Your average guy here was a 40 something dude and there were only two women in the whole place, the secretary and a lady in quality control. When we got sent home for the pandemic in March 2020, I pretty quickly became strapped for cash and went back. Since they fulfilled government contracts, their business was deemed necessary and they stayed open. I worked from early April until August that year and made a pretty decent chunk of change. As he raised me from $15 to $17 an hour and put me in the shop running CNC machines. Before that, I'd been putting something called helicoils into machine parts which basically just makes the threads where bolts go heavy duty. Not a very hard job, but very time consuming. That being said, I was very good at this job. On average, I'd finished twice as many parts a shift as the next guy who'd been working there for about 25 years. This will be important later. We didn't go back to school in fall 2020 as the pandemic was still happening, but I saved up enough cash at the place to be comfortable for a while. I took that fall off of school hoping that by spring we'd be back on campus. In the meantime, I signed up to volunteer with the Red Cross. I drove vans for them, transporting blood from their donor center and lab in Cleveland to area hospitals as far out as Sharon, Pennsylvania. I absolutely loved it as helping people and doing fulfilling work is very important to me. Soon enough, I was the team leader out of the location in my city and was running three shifts a week which would each span anywhere from five to eight hours. In spring 2021, I also moved into a new role as the chief of staff for an esports org on my campus. I'll post another story about that later, which ate up a lot of time. Nobody else on our board did much work, and I was the only one with experience talking to administration, so I got nailed with a ton of busy work. But again, it was something I loved to do. Just to see all the happy folks at the events we Well, I organized. Both the Red Cross and this esports thing were also very important resume builders for me, as they gave me leadership and bureaucratic experience that looks really good on a political science and communications resume, which is what I'm studying in college. Needless to say, the machine shop work didn't do that for me. It was money and little more. In the month leading up to fall 2021, 
It became clear to me that, with the savings I had, I wouldn't be able to afford to finish college. I would have to work while I was in school, something of 30 hours a week to make it work. At this point, I decided to go back to the shop for a few days to make a little extra cash before I head out, and line up 8 days on the schedule to work, 4 weeks working Thursday and Friday. I'm doing this because I'm still taking 3 or more volunteer shifts a week with the Red Cross, plus my responsibilities with the eSports org. My boss does in fact know about both of these things. The shop puts me back in the assembly room, installing those coils and some wash tubs. Each part has about 50 different coils in 3 different sizes, and each part is so heavy that they have to be moved with a small 1 ton crane in the assembly room. Then on top of that, the coils had a nasty habit of not going in right or otherwise failing, so we'd have to remove and reinstall 5 or more coils apart. Because of this, most people only finished 5 or 6 parts a shift. I, however, am particularly efficient and take pride in my work, so I'd get 10 on most days. The shipment had 80 tubs left when they pulled me in for those 8 days, and I was going to work on those tubs the whole time. My boss reckoned that with just me on the tubs, I'd be able to finish the shipment before I left, whereas he'd put two of his other workers on the job to do the same without me. I promise you he knew this going in. On the fifth day of work, I'm starting to get pretty burnt out, and the stress of affording college was starting to get to me. I had one job lined up and a number of applications outstanding. I wasn't necessarily worried, just a bit wound up, tense, and exhausted. I voiced my frustrations to my boss and my worries about affording college. That's when this guy, a 70-something multi-millionaire who just pushes papers all day, decided to piss me off. Instead of consoling me in any way, offering reassurance or, dare I say, a bonus for my clearly excess productivity, which he brought me in for, he decides to go with, there's 168 hours in a week, work as much as you like. I push back and say that I literally cannot do that. I'm working 11am to 7pm, Monday through Wednesday with Red Cross, and fill most of my weekends and evenings with networking and emails for esports. I couldn't take more hours in this job without giving up one of two activities which are more professionally relevant to me, or taking a hit to my sleep. Even if I did all of those things and worked 60 hour weeks, I only had one week left before I went to campus. Needless to say, even with 20 hours of overtime pay, I still wouldn't have been able to magically afford college. I'd still have to work two jobs as a full time student either way. But wait, there's more. After I tell him that I literally cannot take more hours without it being a detriment to my career or mental health, he goes on to tell me that I'm lazy, irresponsible, and have never worked for a thing in my life. I'll remind you, I am, far and away, his most productive worker when I'm in the shop, whether I'm running machines or installing coils. I'll also note that my family makes a whopping $25,000 a year as a family of four. It's enough to live in Northeast Ohio, but that's about it. Everything I own and use, including my phone, car, insurance, computer, I pay for with my own money that I earned working in this guy's shop. At this point, I ask myself why I'm bothering with this guy. Then I remember, he's relying on me to finish this batch of parts. Everyone else is tied up on different orders. If I leave, this shipment goes unfinished and he'll be forced to delay. I only have three days left scheduled to work and that money isn't going to do anything for me if I'm going to be working 30 hours a week anyways, so why am I here? The next morning, I text him at 6 o'clock in the morning and tell him I'm not going to come in for the remainder of my shifts. This man, who I'll remind you is a 70-something multi-millionaire, loses his mind. In text, he's cursing out the wazoo, telling me how I'm destroying his business and how I screwed him over and how if I was actually smart with money I would have quit my volunteer activities and put in the work. I keep it respectful and inform him that his disrespect lost him a valuable employee and now he's gotta pay the price. I later found out from a co-worker that the shipment ended up being about a month late. Because of how this shop's contracts work, he'd have to refund 1% of the contract price for each day the shipment is late. For this contract, 30% late fees would have amounted to around $200,000. 
Maybe if he was smarter with his money, he wouldn't have hinged $200,000 of late fees on the work ethic of one lazy, irresponsible 20-year-old kid who's never worked for a thing in his life. I mean, what more can you say? OP was pretty darn clear with their intentions. Went to the person to vent frustrations, was hoping for some kind of assistance or resolution, and this 70 year old who probably grew up plenty through that period of, you gotta pull yourself up by your bootstraps, thought OP was just some whining little punk. Well, let's see if you feel the same way when you have to pay $200,000. And our final story of the day is by Remarkable Youth 504 Boss tried to screw me over, I start a dumpster fire. This happened almost five years ago. Some details are intentionally vague. I was working in an organization that was super toxic, so much so that we were a revolving door. Most employees stayed only a few months. To counter this, our management put three months notice into everyone's contract, including existing employees. It's not strictly illegal where this happened, but very unusual. I believe the idea was to make it harder for employees to find a job outside, as employers didn't usually want to wait for three months. However, this didn't work as people simply quit and waited for a month or two before starting their job hunt. I was there almost four years. I needed the money, so I put up with whatever abusive stuff was thrown at me. My boss was a guy we'll call Vince, not actual name. Now, Vince was not particularly good, but he sometimes respected the fact that I was the most tenured grunt in the organization. Enter Rajesh, not the actual name. Rajesh was brought in from outside for strategically improving our division. This was quite strange given our division generated the most profits. Within months, Rajesh made the environment even more toxic. He pulled Vince's team under him and got Vince fired, and he actively encouraged us grunts to spy on each other. Rajesh also headed out for me from day one. To the state, I don't know why. He started making my life more harder than the others. This culminated in him taking me aside and telling me that I was not pulling my weight. Now at this point, I was doing quite well in the organization. Plus, I was doing a lot of additional work, since only I knew certain systems and processes. See high attrition above. So I was quite angry. I started looking out. I still wasn't brave enough to quit and start looking. Fortunately, I was able to find a job that was willing to wait the three months. So it was my turn to take Rajesh aside and tell him I quit. Boy, Rajesh was pissed. He went from denial, you can't quit, to negotiation, what if I give you a raise at the year end, to acceptance. Thus, I was serving my notice and working away like an honest bee, my usual work plus the additional work. At this point, I was called by HR and told that Rajesh wanted me gone. The insane part was that they wanted me to pay the company for the two and a half month shortfall in notice. I obviously refused, then went back and checked the contract. Turns out a notice of less than three months could only happen through mutual consent. And the initiating party, company if they wanted me gone sooner, or me if I wanted to leave earlier, had to compensate the other party for the shortfall. Cue the malicious compliance. The next day, I stopped doing anything at all. I logged in and logged out my hours and did nothing. Not my work, definitely not the additional responsibilities. Soon there was a complete meltdown all around. Rajesh would pull me into meetings and scream and try to bully me, and I would say nothing but smirk. Then they tried to have someone else learn from me so that they could do what I did. Remember I said earlier how I was the only one who knew some of the old systems and processes? Well, now I claimed I didn't really remember any of them, so obviously there could be no handover. Soon my workplace turned into a dumpster fire. The HR slash Rajesh smartened up and offered to buy out my notice if I cooperated and helped transition my work. I refused. Then, to twist the knife further, I started having meetings with fellow grunts. Remember, everyone was always a newbie and encouraging them to leave as well. HR tried to get me to leave twice more but I ended up serving the full three months. Remember the mutual consent part? I mean, yeah, overall, their whole policy here is just insane. Imagine trying to make somebody work three months after they're saying they're wanting to quit. Honestly, it seems like something that might help out the company from preventing turnover, but honestly, all it does is it seems to me just stands to hurt the company more than help. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. 
So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.